Imagine this, a husband moves a mistress into a family home, but guess what? His wife is there too. She's upstairs. She's a moved into my house with me and my five kids. Her should have stayed up in Michigan. She shouldn't have moved down here. She shouldn't have moved into my house. How could you possibly have thought that was gonna go well? That's the voice of Anne Marie Anastasi who decides to do something about her cheating husband, Anthony, and his mistress, Jacqueline Riggs. The police department receives a 911 call reporting that my husband is not breathing. And it's just that. This mystery starts unraveling the minute 911 is called. Who has done what? I'm Michelle Trachtenberg, and this is Meet Mary Murder. In 2015, Maryland and the Anastasis look like a typical family. Anne Marie and Anthony Anastasi had been married for 18 years, they had five kids. They lived in a rented home in this little town called Lothian, Maryland. It's about less than an hour from Washington, D.C. It's a nice house. I mean, it's a nice probably four or five bedroom home on a sizable chunk of land uh, in the southern part of the county, which is pretty rural. Nothing out of the ordinary, apparently. But things are not quite as they seemed. They had a rather unconventional marriage. Unconventional? You got that right. Younger woman in the basement. She isn't the nanny. She isn't a relative or a friend. She's a lover. So when did the twosome become a threesome? It's a story which starts 700 miles away when Anthony first meets Jackie Riggs. The Anastasis uh, lived in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. Anthony was a volunteer youth hockey coach. During his coaching, he met Ms. Riggs. She's 25 years old. Now, Anne Marie's 43, and her husband is a few years younger. And at some point along the way, some sort of romantic relationship developed that was extramarital to his relationship with Anne Anastasi. What do we know about Jackie? Everybody says she's a straight up woman, loves kids, but she's a woman and Anastasi never wanted to see again. At some point in time, the Anastasis left Michigan and moved as a family to Lothian, Maryland in Anne Arundel County. Ms. Anastasi believed at the time that that would be the end of Mr. Anastasi's extramarital relationship with Ms. Riggs. Anne and Anthony came from Maryland and want to go home. Why? Anne wants to put 700 miles between her and Jackie. Subsequent to the Anastasis moving to Maryland, Ms. Riggs was moved by Mr. Anastasi from Michigan down to Maryland and moved into the Anastasis basement. Anthony decides he wants to move Jacqueline into the house. Let's have her live with us and we can all live happily ever after. She shouldn't have moved down here. She shouldn't have moved into my house. How could you possibly have thought that was going to go well? Once she was there, she was maybe not quite a member of the family, but lived there. And Ms. Anastasi, actually, from what we understand, made dinner. And Ms. Riggs would join the entire family for dinner in the evenings. Does Jackie Riggs know what she's getting into? She's 25 and moving in with a family as a lover to the dad and husband? Crazy, right? And it's no five-star hotel either. The physical environment in which Ms. Riggs lived with the Anastasis did not objectively look very pleasant. You know, concrete floors, no walls, you know, no real privacy in the basement. The basement was unfinished, uh, but it had a bed and some of the other, some furniture that you would put in a place to make it look like a bedroom. 
Anthony Anastasi has got it made. A young lover. Downstairs, the missus looking after the kids. Guess what? Anne-Marie put up with it, but she hates it. She clearly hoped that the relationship terminated when they moved to Maryland and was very disappointed when Ms. Riggs moved back in with them subsequently. But there was, we never saw anything where she put up some sort of resistance and tried to prevent it. Anne-Marie may be disappointed. That doesn't stop her joining Jackie and Anthony for a literal three-way in the basement. The little bit that I know about it was that Ms. Anastasi stated that at one point in time, Mr. Anastasi had convinced her to engage in sexual activity with him and Ms. Riggs, but Ms. Anastasi said that only ever happened the one time. She didn't like it and refused to participate in that ever again. And guess what? Anthony focuses on the 25-year-old downstairs, the mother of his kids, and his wife? She's out of the sexual picture. Now, suddenly, this threesome is becoming a twosome. It's like three's a crowd and Anne-Marie isn't invited. Now, Anthony and Jacqueline are having sex more often and Anne-Marie is on the outs. Pretty soon, before she knows it, Anne-Marie's husband is basically living with this younger woman down in the basement. Now I have to ask this question, Anne. Do you think that your husband and Jacqueline were messing around? Oh, I know they were. They were, and how do you know they were? Because he'd spend most, well not most, he'd spend a lot of nights down there with the doors locked. Okay. Like a lot of them. Did you ever confront him about it? I was told that basically to mind my own business, and he's gonna do what he wants to do, and if I don't like it, I can get that out of the house. Okay. And I'm not gonna abandon my kids and gotcha. leave them in that kind of situation. Ms. Anastasi was questioned by the police in some detail, essentially along the lines of, you're a human, you cannot be okay with the behavior in which your husband was engaged with Ms. Riggs. One day, the cops are going to need to prove Anne doesn't like Anthony having sex with Jackie. This phone secret recording is going to help their case. The problem is, it's not only him. There's also a 24-year-old girl. It was dead in my basement. She was a f moved into my house with me and my five kids. Her f should have stayed up in f Michigan. And Anne Marie is basically my 18 year marriage is basically over. I've just lost him to this younger woman. The information we developed subsequently when we were listening to her phone calls while she was incarcerated certainly demonstrated that she was incredibly devastated emotionally, and that's what drove her to commit these crimes. Anne-Marie wants her husband to stop cheating in her own home. Enough is enough. She elected to just become the judge, jury, and executioner on her own and decided that Mr. Anastasia was gonna die and Ms. Riggs was gonna die. It's the plan. It's the blueprint for murder. Half of women killed are murdered by their partners. Honestly, we should be careful who we get into bed with. I'm Michelle Trachtenberg, and this is Meet Mary Murder. Men can be victims too, like Anthony Anastasi, whose wife discovers he's been spending her cash. She had this million dollar trust fund. They spent it all, and he's telling her to go back to her family and get even more money. And whenever they get more money, he spends it on himself. He buys himself flat screen TVs and Harley Davidson motorcycles. It's all about Anthony and what Anthony needs, what Anthony wants. She certainly seemed to be someone who was suff suffering from some sort of emotional abuse. What makes this so difficult is that she elected to not avail herself of any resources whatsoever, to not seek help. She elected to just become the judge, jury, and executioner on her own and decided that Mr. Anastasia was gonna die and Ms. Riggs was gonna die and that was the only resolution to this problem. Maybe she's happy to be judge and jury, but she isn't happy to pull a trigger. So Anne reaches out to her daughter. 
We got some phone records. And that night, you and talk for 582 seconds. Oh. Three in the morning. That's about 10 minutes. Mm, that might have been a butt dial. That's not a butt dial. That's a long conversation. Anne-Marie convinced her daughter that Anthony was discarding Anne-Marie as a piece of trash. She tells her 13-year-old daughter, your father has to die. Her mother talks her into this. She gets involved in this murder plot. She's a kid. And she's just trying to please her mother. The teenage girl has her own reasons to be angry. She overhears her father and Jackie talking about starting their own family. So now, his daughter faces seeing her dad having a baby with a woman young enough to be her sister, all while living in their house. Mother and daughter agree Anthony and Jacqueline should die, and they know someone who could do the job. Messages on Anne-Marie's phone tell us who agreed to be the hitman. They examine Anne-Marie's phone, and they find these text messages between Anne-Marie, her 13-year-old daughter Sarah, and Sarah's 18-year-old boyfriend Gabriel Stress. In those text messages, they're talking about a gun and the murder of two people. But what's in it for Gabriel? He has nothing against Anthony Anastasi and Jacqueline Riggs, but this is a kid with a past. Not a good one. Gabriel Struss was a young man who had a very difficult childhood. Now here's a guy who has no criminal record. He's basically sort of raised himself on the streets from the time he's seven. He was adopted as a young man, uh, subsequently left his adoptive family to return to his biological family. He wound up, at the time of the murder, living in very unfortunate conditions a few miles away from the Anastasis. And he's basically raised himself, period. He really didn't have a, a great growing up life. Basically kind of a homeless guy and kind of a guy who could be led. Anne-Marie sees Gabriel Struss as a sucker, hers to boss around. This young boy, he's 18, but He's not terribly sophisticated, hasn't had a great upbringing, doesn't, he's kind of gullible. Mr. Struss was uniquely positioned to fall victim to Ms. Anastasi's manipulations. So now you have the story of this scorned wife who has convinced her daughter to join her in this plot, and oh, let's get your boyfriend to do the dirty work for us. The messaging between these three? Don't think they're not going to be found. Cell phones break secrets. He was communicating over Kick. It's one of those apps that if you use it, it's supposed to delete after you use it. Like, so he was communicating with her over Kick and Snapchat and the things that teenagers do. The texts are a dead giveaway, a blueprint for murder. In those text messages, they're talking about a gun and the murder of two people. Mr. Struss told us that the night of the murder, he was picked up by Ms. Anastasi in her car and driven to the Anastasi home. He got out of the car and hid in the yard for some amount of time that he could not specify because he claimed to have actually fallen asleep out in the yard while he was out there. At some point in the middle of the night, he received a message on his phone calling him into the house. Gabriel Struss goes into the Anastasi house that night and he's ready to kill. He's following the order of his girlfriend's mother. She knows that she has to make Jacqueline's death look like a crime of passion, of rage. It was a very just brutal, gruesome scene in the basement. This is Meet Mary Murder, and I'm Michelle Trachtenberg. We're in Lothian, Maryland, and an 18-year-old kid, Gabriel Struss, is following his girlfriend's mother's plan to kill Anthony Anastasi. He creeps into the family home. 
On October 4th, 2015, Anne Marie hands Gabriel the handgun and a knife. Why? You see, Anne Marie's already thinking. She knows that she has to make Jacqueline's death look like a crime of passion, of rage. So he meets Anne Marie in the kitchen of the home. She gives him a knife, and then that night, Gabriel goes down the stairs to Jacqueline's bedroom where she's sleeping. And he attacks. Ms. Riggs did not die right away from one stab wound. A, I think a common misperception is that from movies and TVs, if you stab someone once, that they just die. But the reality is that Ms. Riggs was stabbed and woke up and fight or flight kicked in and Ms. Riggs started putting up quite a fight. And Mr. Struss had to stab her multiple times all over the chest, the head, the face, before he was able to actually kill her. And he stabs her 42 times. He just keeps stabbing her and stabbing her and stabbing her. And then when he's done, She's not moving, she's clearly dead. It was a very just brutal, gruesome scene in the basement with the amount of times he had to stab her and the amount of force he had to use to actually kill Ms. Riggs. She was fighting for her life and she did everything she could to ward off Mr. Struss. Anne Marie has figured everything out, including her version of what's happened down to the last detail. When the police come, she wants them to think her husband has first killed Jackie and then himself. Once he had killed Ms. Riggs, he went back upstairs. He then was given the 380 handgun by Ms. Anastasi. Gabriel Struss, he's covered in the blood of Jacqueline Riggs. He heads up to the first floor to finish the job he had started. He then went upstairs and stood a couple feet away from Mr. Anastasi's bed and fired the one round into Mr. Anastasi's head. He then left the home and went back over to his home in the Annapolis area for the rest of the night. Ms. Anastasi, from what we were able to gather, what went and took the 45 caliber handgun that Mr. Anastasi had under his pillow at night out from under the pillow and put that into his hand to make it look as if he had shot himself. And then according to the statement that she gave the police, she subsequently went and crawled in bed in a different room and slept until the morning. Nobody finds out what's happened in that big house on West Bay Front Road. It all looks normal until around lunchtime on October 5th, 2015. The police department receives a 911 call. It's not a frantic call, but it's a 911 call reporting that my husband is not breathing. And it's just that. This mystery, if one can call it that, starts unraveling the minute 911 is called. I just had the day taking kids to the dentist and then going grocery shopping. I'm supposed to be leaving to take my husband to a doctor's appointment right now. This 911 call, what a bizarre call. The person is conversational. There's not a sense of panic. There's no heavy breathing. It's very matter of fact. Hey, I came home and my husband's not breathing. He's laying on the bed. But he's not responding at all. And he's got his gun laying next to him in the bed. Do you think he shot himself? I don't know. I didn't turn the lights on in the room. Yeah, I think he killed himself. You know, just very nonchalant, matter of fact, conversational, not panic. Where's that sheer panic? She may not have realized at the time, but from the very first moment she starts talking to the 911 dispatcher, Anne Marie is incriminating herself. When the suspect themselves call 911, 
It's often in that first minute, that first two minutes of that 911 call that either the motive will be revealed or the alibi. Brian Harris knows murder. He's investigated plenty as a homicide detective. They'll repeat over and over again what their alibi is. It's no different in this case. What's the alibi? Oh, I came home. Was wondering where my husband was and he's laying in the bed and he's not breathing. But he's not responding at all and he's got his gun laying next to him in the bed. So she clearly wants to establish that all these series of events that would take place in the home happened when she wasn't there. Now this emergency dispatcher is thinking, this is bizarre. So a couple uh, patrol officers from the Southern District of the Anne Arundel County Police Department responded to the scene. When they arrived at the Anastasi home, Ms. Anastasi came outside and reported that her husband was dead inside. The police rush to this home and they see this, this charming house on the outside and they go inside and there's this house that is just filthy and full of clutter. When the officers get there, uh, and they go upstairs to the master bedroom, they find Mr. Anastasi lying on his back in his bed, suffering from a single gunshot wound to the head with a pistol in his hand. And Anne-Marie says, well, you know, he was depressed. I mean, so he obviously killed himself. So as a detective, if that's my scene I'm coming to, if somebody's trying to say it's suicide, I'm gonna look at that person's life. Sure, Anthony's been depressed. Sure, Anthony's had some dark things going on in his life, kind of a bizarre lifestyle to begin with. But Anthony's own body would tell me a story. Anthony is lying face up with a single bullet wound. He's dead. There's a gun lying next to him. You see, if there's suicide, you would have what's called stippling, or tattooing from a close gunshot wound, contact wound. Now, that bullet is hot. It's kind of like a branding iron. You have this huge explosion. Typically, anywhere between 12 and 18 inches, if I'm further away than that distance, when I pull the trigger, the entry wound will be nice and clean. If I'm closer than that, I would expect to see what's called stippling or tattooing. That big explosion that comes out of the barrel of a gun, it has to go somewhere. The cops don't see what they expect. If it's a suicide, they should see the stippling around the wound. From the minute they get in, things aren't adding up. Now police aren't sure what they have on their hands. Is this a suicide? Is there anyone else living in the home? No, my kids aren't here, but oh, we have this woman who lives with us. She lives in the basement. But come to think of it, I haven't heard from her today. Suspicion grows. But again, it's very conversational. And so what do the officers do? They're sweeping that home, going room to room, looking for other bodies, perhaps maybe even suspects. They take Anne-Marie aside. They're gonna take her downtown and question her. Meanwhile, officers are running down the stairs. She's casual, cool. So the officers are just not prepared for what they're about to see. As they creep down the stairs, hands on their weapons, who knows what is down there? What do they hear? Heavy metal music? Then they open the door. They go downstairs and in the basement, they find Ms. Riggs laying on the ground. And they open the bedroom door and it's like a scene from Helter Skelter. And it's a bloody, brutal scene that they find. They find the body of yet another victim, Jacqueline Riggs. There is blood everywhere. And there is Jacqueline Riggs lying dead on this blood-soaked rug. She's been stabbed 42 times. 40 plus stab wounds all across her body, 40 plus stab wounds. Imagine that, one, two, three, 
4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. Anne Marie is cooperating with the police. She is calm, but the scene in the basement tells detectives of an out of control rage. It is chaos down there. And they ask themselves, where does Anne Marie Anastasi fit into all of this? Is she the killer? Ms. Anastasi presented herself in her interviews to the police as the grieving widow who loved her family, loved her husband, was willing to tolerate his indiscretions. The gun that was found next to your husband was tested, okay? And compared to the bullet that was found in his skull, okay? There is no possible way that that weapon fired that bullet that was in your husband's head. We've got two blood-soaked bodies, Anthony Anastasi and Jackie Riggs, lying in the Anastasi family home. The medical examiner arrives to remove them for the autopsy. Meanwhile, police are questioning Anne-Marie. They've got her downtown, and they're asking her questions, and Anne-Marie keeps saying, my husband committed suicide. I know he was depressed. It was a suicide. And they say, well, what about the other woman, the what? What about Jacqueline Riggs? She's got 42 stab wounds. What? Anne-Marie seems shocked and distressed by what she's hearing from the detectives. But she gives them a ready-made explanation. Ms. Anastasi's initial statement to the police was that she had heard Mr. Anastasi and Ms. Riggs engage in a heated argument in the basement of the home. He then came upstairs to the master bedroom, kicked her out of the bedroom, and then shut the door, and she never saw him alive again. Anne-Marie, when the cops are talking to her, they want to know, what do you think happened? Which is a great question. What do you think happened, Anne-Marie? She buys into it, and she says, I think that Anthony killed Jacqueline, that he went down they have a relationship, he kills her, and he can't live with himself for what he did, that he's so remorseful that he shoots and kills himself. Ms. Anastasi presented herself in her interviews to the police as the grieving widow who loved her family, loved her husband, was willing to tolerate his indiscretions, and was just devastated that this horrible event had befallen her and her family. Is she going to get away with this? She's been living in a broken marriage with a husband and his mistress, plenty of motive. But some of the evidence might support her story of a murder-suicide. She could walk. Based on just what the officers found at the scene, just by looking at it before they performed, performed any sort of crime scene investigation and based on that statement, it presented as a murder-suicide. Might be a viable story, but you see, the evidence would show that that's completely different. As a detective, I often warn other detectives, don't judge people on the way that they grieve. However, when you look at the behavior of Anne Marie, is it just bizarre behavior? and she's in shock? Or is this well thought of responses to questions? During the course of Ms. Anastasi's first interview with the police, they advised her that they discovered Ms. Riggs's body in the basement and that she had also been murdered. Ms. Anastasi hardly registered any response or emotion at all. Police discover that 
the gun lying next to Anthony doesn't match the bullet that came from his body. There's no way that that bullet could have come from that gun. Mr. Anastasi had a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol in his hand. Police could not find a 45 caliber shell casing in the bedroom. They subsequently were able to find a 380 caliber shell casing in the bedroom. That was subsequently analyzed by the firearms examiner for the Anne Arundel County Police Department, who gave a definitive conclusion that you could not fire a 380 bullet from the 45 caliber handgun. Anne Marie didn't count on that. Mr. Anastasi's autopsy came back to reveal that the round in his head was in fact a 380 caliber bullet. Once you know Mr. Anastasi was killed by the 380 caliber bullet, they knew that the 45 caliber handgun that was in Mr. Anastasi's hand was not the murder weapon. The gun that was found next to your husband was tested, okay, and compared to the bullet that was found in his skull, okay? There is no possible way that that weapon fired that bullet that was in your husband's head. It's a completely different weapon. So that means somebody planted that weapon there. This is murder. It has murder written all over it. The detectives make a breakthrough. But does Anne-Marie fold? No, she's unemotional, even a little detached. What does she care? She's got nothing to do with it. Two people were murdered in your home, brutally murdered, okay? And you didn't know what happened? No. But the evidence is building. The cops can prove this is murder, not murder-suicide. It is not looking good for Anne-Marie. At any murder scene, one of the basic things you would do if there's gunshots that are involved, we would do what's called a GSR test, a gunshot residue test. She consented to having her hands and her clothing tested for the presence of gunshot residue, so she voluntarily gave up her clothes. There's a couple things I need to clear up real quick. Certainly. The test that they took from your clothes and your hands, mm -hmm. Well, they were all sent off. Probably found lots of cat milk on there. Well, we found a lot of gunshot residue on you and on the on the clothes. Really? Yeah. Well, that's weird. She's got a lot of explaining to do. So now you have a gun that's not matching up. You've got two people dead. You've got gunshot residue on the wife. And what do they have on their hands? Now, this is clearly not just a murder-suicide. They also took her while she was at the police station on the first night, and she agreed to undergo a polygraph examination. You have a failed polygraph. You not just failed it, you flunked the hell out of it. Have you been untruthful during this investigation? No. Did you shoot your husband? No. During the course of the polygraph examination, she did poorly on questions regarding what happened and the exact details, whether she was involved, if she knew what happened. It's a tense time for Anne Arundel County detectives. They know she did it, but do they have enough to charge Anne Marie Anastasi with a double homicide? The combination of the failed polygraph, Ms. Anastasi's story not being completely logical, and the subsequent evidence that the police developed regarding the firearm, regarding the gunshot residue, that all led to identifying her as the prime suspect. Anne Marie refuses to talk, but when the cops track down 18-year-old Gabriel Struss, he crumbles. Gabriel, when he's confronted, a rock could have taken his confession. Gabriel, right away, freely, starts flowing with the story of what took place takes responsibility, lays it all out, and explains exactly what happened. When they go to Gabriel Struss, he confesses right away, I did it, I'm involved, yes, I killed them. But I'm not the one who masterminded it. It was her idea. And then the story starts coming out. Gabriel can't stop talking so investigators pieced together Anne-Marie's plan for murder 
and how she intended to get away with it. Ms. Anastasi got up in the morning, went through her family's normal routine, got the children off to school. She subsequently had a doctor's appointment and then she went to a grocery store. She came back to the home and somewhere in the 12 or one o'clock hour called 911 to report that Mr. Anastasi was dead. Turns out, as plans go, this one isn't good. But he's not responding at all, and he's got his gun laying next to him in the bed. Do you think he shot himself? Her actions after m both Mr. Anastasi and Ms. Riggs were dead were exactly that of someone who had a plan. And th that's one of the main things we relied on in determining to charge her with first degree premeditated murder because you know obviously she had this plan leading up to Mr. Anastasi and Mrs. Riggs's death but then she clearly had thought through the entire crime not just how to commit it but then she had a plan for after it was committed for how to try to get away with it. Gabriel Struss gets 60 years in prison. He tells Jacqueline Riggs's family that he wishes he could take back what he had done. The prosecutors say he was just a puppet it was the angry wife who planned everything. But Anne Marie won't accept blame for her part in the killing of her husband and his lover. Anne Marie takes this special plea, this Alfred deal, that allows her to avoid saying I did it. She never has to admit it. She doesn't take responsibility for it. What it tells me, as a fellow human being, as a homicide detective, Anne Marie, she never accepts responsibility never shows any remorse. There's never an opportunity to see any kind of human side, human emotional side of Anne Marie. What kind of a mother does this? She's so angry at her husband. She's feeling so betrayed because he's left her and, and her 18 year marriage is over with because of this woman, this younger woman, For you are so mad. You want them gone, but you can't do it. So you, you actually get your young daughter involved in this murder plot and get her boyfriend involved in this murder plot. How can a mother live with herself? How can a mother do this and then never accept responsibility for it and never show any remorse? The havoc she left behind and she could still never take full responsibility, but she also receives a 60 year sentence as if she was the one that pulled the trigger, as if she was the one who plunged the knife 42 times into Jacqueline Riggs. Crazy story, right? Remember, the person most likely to kill you could be the person you married. I'm Michelle Trachtenberg, and I'll see you next time on Meet, Mary Murder.